Sweet. Uh, yeah. All right, 702. So I think we've waited long enough. Um, so okay. welcome, everybody. Um, hoping everyone can hear me. Can I just get a couple of thumbs up? Obviously, Nags, you can hear me because you know the spiel about jokes. Yep, thanks, Ben. Good, Richard. Um, uh, tonight, uh, Ryan McHugh is going to pre be presenting. He's going to be presenting on how to maximise a training session. Now, when we went through this, it's a fairly uh, diverse topic and there's obviously a lots of different ways we can approach it. Um, so we think Ryan's approach is pretty good tonight, but obviously there's going to be a lot of questions that potentially he hasn't addressed or maybe there's something that you feel is like, oh, wow, maybe that's the wrong topic. By all means, ask away. Um, I'm going to be the moderator tonight. So you can just send through um, messages over the chat to me. If you just click on my name on the on the right um, chat bar, it'll it'll go direct to me. And then I can ask that uh, of Ryan or I can try and answer it over text if that's what you want. Um, but that's I think that's going to be a really good way to ask questions because I, I'm getting a lot of questions over emails, which I love. Um, but if you can ask them here and we can have a chat about them, often it's easier for us to convey um, the message when we can talk about it versus write about it because that's um, that's a whole lot tougher. Um, all right, well, without further ado, um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. So I'll let Ryan uh, take over now. And then Ryan, if you can just let me know when you want me to share my screen and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do that for you. By all means, no worries. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you for everyone for joining tonight. I believe this is our uh, third week of doing these coaches sessions via Zoom. Uh, it's a terrific chance for everybody to, to get to learn something. And uh, we've really tried over these last couple of weeks to um, present something different each week for you guys. So we really do appreciate everybody who has um, joined in tonight. So as uh, Joel said, my name is Ryan McHugh and I'm the uh, development coordinator for Basketball Ballarat. I've been in this role now for roughly about three years. I've been fortunate enough to represent my state as the assistant coach to the under 18s men teams for the last three years. I'm the co-head coach to the Youth League Ballarat Miners, and I'm also the assistant coach to the NBL1 Ballarat Miners. So right now, a lot of my experiences are more at the elite senior level. So what I'll talk about tonight, I'll try my best to bring it back to a grassroots level, a domestic level, and hopefully everybody can, um, can get something out of this uh, presentation tonight. So with that being said, we'll, uh, we'll jump through to our first slide, if that's all right, Joel. Perfect. We can just jump to the next one, please, Joel. Awesome. So to start, so obviously tonight's theme is um, is maximising your training session. So the first thing that I've got here is uh, having a clear session plan. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read through my slide and then I'm going to um, go into it a little bit and see if we uh, have any questions at the end. So your session plan should navigate you through your training session. Have clear times for each drill and ensure the time will be efficient for what you ultimately want to achieve. Your, your coaching point should be written down so you communicate your direct point and avoid going on a tangent, which as uh, coaches, I think we can, um, can all be, uh, we can all be uh, definitely accused of that at times, especially me, I know I can. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is uh, obviously the start, your session plan should help navigate you through your training session. So, your session plan should have the times of each drill, when you want to move on, things you really want to focus on. They should really help you navigate your way through the session so you don't end up spending too much time on something. Now, when you strip it right back to a junior level, strictly just needing a session plan, even at a domestic level, you need to have a session plan. Otherwise, you'll end up finishing up warm-ups or whatever you know your first drill may be, and then you're sort of like, oh, what do I do now? Do I go do free throws? Do we do layups? Or it just becomes a little bit messy. To do a good session plan at a junior level should only take you five or 10 minutes. So I really recommend finding that time and then um, and getting underway. So, and the other point that we've got there is uh, having your coaching points written down. So on a normal session plan for me at a youth league level or an even NBL one level, we have the drill. And then on the side, I'll just put something else where I've written out what those coaching points need to be for that drill. So if we're doing a rebounding drill, for example, I've written down that I'm going to be focusing on hit, find, get, which is a boxing out method that we use, which is uh, hit the body, find the man, and we go get after the ball. So that's, uh, that's something that we use 
And that's something that I note down in my session plan. So I know that that's the point that I'm going to be talking about. I'm not going to be just going off talking about random things and actually end up wasting time during my session. So definitely have clear times for each drill, communicate your points, and uh, definitely have a session plan because in the long run, it will help you maximize your training session. Ready to move on to the next one, if you are Joel. Wonderful. So what I have here is um, what's called, um, it's my SMART acronym. So I've sort of used this over the last couple of years um, throughout all my coaching levels. And it's something that I use to, uh, to track my training sessions. So SMART standing for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each one now, have a bit of a talk about it. And uh, at the end, you guys might have any questions or things like that. Be, uh, feel free to note take during this um, this meeting as well. And uh, obviously at the end, we can always have a bit of a chat as well. So the first one is specific. So the goals and the overall purpose for your training must be specific to the players. So you're actually saving time if you and the players know what your goal is and what your purpose is for each drill during your session plan. You are saving yourself time by communicating that, being really specific with what you want, the players aren't sort of looking around going, oh, actually, I've got no idea what coach wants from me. You bang into it and you know what you need to do. So the second one is measurable. Learning objectives need to be measurable. Hang so on, you sorry, are able Ryan. to evaluate. Sorry to interrupt you. Can, any, can everyone see my screen? I think I might have lost it. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it or thumbs down if you can't see it? Oh, you can. Oh, good. Well, sorry I've been stuffed around with it so much. I didn't think you could see it. Sorry. Continue, Ryan. My bad. We all good. That's all yeah. right. Um, Yes, measurable. So able to evaluate the success of your training session. So how will you measure each drill? So that's something that I have as well. So you've obviously come up with a drill. You want to measure its success. So you might have a goal. You might be doing a layup drill, for example, where you're doing, I don't know, maybe at a junior level, you're wanting to get X number of layups in each hand. You want to be able to measure that. So on your session plan, you've written, you know, ideally we want to be able to get 30 in a minute or something like that whatever it might be you have that there so you can you can measure the drill and you can ultimately see if it was a success or not uh third we have attainable attainable goal um they can be ambitious but keep in mind that they need to be realistic and attainable given the group that you coach so um will they actually get there or not so sometimes i'm a big believer in you know, you're always wanting to reach for more. You might set a higher goal or something like that and make your players, you know, really work hard to get there. But I'm also a big believer in, in, in letting them get there too, especially at a junior level. Set something that's realistic so they can get there. Then they're going to be super stoked. Team morale is going to be really high. Everybody's going to be getting around one another and they're going to be stoked because they reached that goal. So I'm very, I'm very big at a junior level with set stuff that you know they can get. Otherwise, if it's week after week and they're not getting anything, they're just going to, you know, be pretty bummed out. So, uh, attainable. So, the fourth one is relevant. So, basically, is it necessary and is it needed during the session? So, if you have an hour's training session and you've broken down your drills, you need to make sure that what's in there is relevant and it's needed for tonight's session. So if you're only training once a week with your team, some of us at a rep level and things like that are lucky to train twice a week, you need to be sure that, um, that it's relevant to your training session. And the last one and probably the most important one is time. So you need to keep an eye on your time of your session so you can be sure you've conducted a productive and successful training session. So you need to know it and you need to work with it. So again, I just said, you know, stock standard hour session for most junior teams and even some senior teams, by the time you take drink breaks out of that, by the time you take warm ups and cool downs out of that, you may be only on floor for 45 to 50 minutes. So you need to make sure that your training plan reflects that. So ultimately you can maximize your training session the best possible way. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything on uh, my little SMART acronym here that I've got going? If you do, feel free to send them through to Joel. Um, I've got one, Ryan. I just thought it might be a good idea um, if you can, you were talking about uh, goals being measurable and attainable, just to maybe give us a couple of examples of either ones you guys use with the, the youth lead team, or even if you just had yep. some ideas 
um, for ones that people might be able to use with a with a younger age group team. Like I based everything last week off the 14 girls. So yep. um, just some, some basic goals on how you're going to work through training. For sure. So uh, for an attainable goal, at least. So at a youth league level, we, um, we always do the Tennessee drill after a warm up uh, because we have a very high competitive group. And it might be the same at a domestic level. You have an under 14s boys and girls group. They come in, they just want to play. They just want to have fun. And, uh, and goal setting can actually be quite an enjoyable thing. So for me, an attainable goal at a youth league level, whilst we are pushing the athletes, you know, we might say four minutes on the clock, we're doing shooting Tennessee drill, which is just basically a full court shooting drill. We're aiming for 85 or something like that. 85 within that four minutes. We think we can reach that. We want to be able to reach that as a coaching staff. We've weighed up and we've discussed that type of drill and how it should look and we've measured it out and know what we want to achieve out of it and we think it's attainable for our guys as well. So it might be something as simple as a layup drill that you do teaching your juniors how to make successful laps in their opposite hand or something like that and you're like, right, everybody's going to get two goes. I think we should be able to get, you know, about 50% of shots made of this or something like that. It's attainable. You might actually say it to your athletes. So now they're looking at it and they're going, right, coach wants us to get this target. And they've got that number in their mind and they're trying to work to that hopefully attainable figure. And um, I know it's putting you on the spot a bit, but what sort yeah. of percentage would you say your session is in terms of competitive against one another versus competitive as a team? So like that, that, that example you gave there, the whole team is competing there against the yep. clock or a time and score versus yep. um, it's the first person to five and then the rest all lose. Like what kind of breakup um, would you say your sessions are roughly? So again, at a senior level, we normally only have like against the clock type of drills and things like that with goals, we might only have two. So out of an hour and a half session, we're probably looking at maybe 15 minutes max of those type of drills. Other than that, everything's competitive in a team setting, which is uh, light on dark, which is how we do things. So every drill that we do at a youth flag level is a competitive drill. And uh, there will be a team that wins and there will be a team that loses. Yeah, I, I would say um, just not a question as much, but to the coaches coaching some of the younger kids, um, I would probably err on a 70-30, trying to get them to compete against the clock um, uh, as a team versus competing against each other, especially at the younger age groups where you might have one kid that is well mm. more physically developed than the other kids. And if they just win everything, like that's good for them, but the other nine kids um, might get fed sure. up with it pretty quickly. So, so yeah, that way, like get them to compete. That way they're, they're, they're on that good physical athlete side, not just being like, oh, I'm so sick of her. I'm so sick of him. They always win. And that way that, yeah, yeah. like that. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that would just be um, something I would add for, for those coaching a bit younger age groups. Did you want me to move the slides on now? Yeah, we will move on if we can. Perfect. So now I've written down here, identify what needs attention. So down in the bottom right corner, I've just put a little tip, which is no take during your training session because like the method that I sort of use or philosophy that I use is I'm always one training session ahead. So if I'm at this training session now, I'm taking notes on things that need to be identified and worked on for the week coming up. So you're always trying to stay one step ahead. So what I've written here is if your, your team is struggling with a certain aspect of the game and you have identified this, allow time. So again, I'm bringing it back to at least the level that I coach at. Myself and the coaching staff, we noticed uh, pretty early on actually in our preseason that we struggled a lot with our defensive transition. So the score goes, we need to quickly be back on defense. We just weren't very good at our positions. Who picks up the ball? Who's in a plug spot? Who's all the way back? Uh, we really struggled with that. And even at a domestic level, you might identify something as simple as uh, where we get really stuck if we get pushed to the sideline. So if, we're, if, I'm, if I'm a defender and I'm pushing you guys to the sideline, like we just really can't get that crossover to get back into the middle of the floor. We really struggle at it. So you might need to spend some time on that. So if you can identify what needs attention and you can identify that early, you can then actually make up some more time for that in a training session. So you might use 10 minutes, 10 minute block for drills, which is a, which is a big lot, but at a domestic level, you might. At more of a senior level, you know, we might break it down a little bit more because we can be a little bit more time efficient. But once me and the coaching staff found out that defensive transition is something that we struggled with, 
we knew, right, we actually need to make more time for this in the coming weeks as we go. Uh, so now something else that I've written, I'm gonna, I've got my quote in the middle there, but I'm actually gonna go uh, to the third line here, which is um, allow time for things you need to improve on. Whilst having time for drills is important, if you are improving and you need more time, then allow it. Like if you are in the middle of a drill, it's going really well, morale's really high, the guys are definitely improving, but you look at the clock and it's time, you need to be able to make the decision like, nah, we need to stick with this for another two minutes. However, you need to ensure that you don't do this for each drill. Like I'll be the first to say that, uh, again, at a senior level, I am a criminal at this. We will be doing something. It'll be working really well. We're, we're just going along with it. My co-coach will just tap me and he'll go like, mate, like we need to move on now. And I'll go, no, 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 it's working so well. Let's just leave it. It's going perfect. And then we get to the end of the session. And it's like, oh, bugger, we missed a good you know, one, maybe even two drills that I really wanted to get through tonight because I was greedy on some other ones. So you just need to be really aware of, um, of what needs attention. So now in the middle here, I've wrote, um, be comfortable with the mess. So this is a quote that I actually got off Peter Lonigan, who works for Basketball Australia. Uh, so what it is, so if you have a drill such as um, a drill that you've set up that's around an aspect of the game that your team's been struggling with, and you're looking at it and it's really messy and it doesn't quite look the way you want it to, sometimes you just need to leave it and just let the players organise it themselves. Even at a domestic level, you need to let the players sort of figure it out themselves and coach themselves a little bit. You might not want to, but there are times, and again, to maximise your training session, you need to make some sacrifices as a coach to, not right now, what's best for this training session is if I just let these guys go a little bit let them talk, let them see if they can figure it out amongst themselves as opposed to you being hands-on. So be comfortable with the mess. If there's something that your team's not particularly good at and you're at training and you're, you're repping it and things like that and it looks ugly, that's okay. Like sometimes you can just sit there and weather the storm, if that makes sense. Uh, any questions on that one? Yep. Oh, I'm not muted. Sorry, I was meant to mute myself then. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I've got, I've got one. Um, yep. So uh, this is from Brad Dennis. So he said, Ryan, uh, you will you say you'll plan or make notes in the current session for things to work on in the next session based yep. on observations, but would you at a senior level extend a certain drill if it needs work at the expense of other drills in that session? Uh, it, it's a really good question. Really good question. Uh, it is really personal preference. Like you've really just got to, chat with your assistants and things like that. Again, at a senior level, if you look at something and you go, right, this needs more time, I will, you know, if I make the call and say, right, we're giving it more time, that's also the time where I'll note take and say, we took 10 minutes or five minutes away from this other drill that I want to do. That also needed a lot of work. So I've now got to allow more time for that next week. So I hope that, I hope that makes sense and I hope that uh, answers your question. Uh, I add to that, um, Brad, in that, I think everything in your session, you, you would have a rough priority on, you know, if it's something that you desperately need, like if it's, if it's an on ball defense that you are just terrible at, like let's say you're trying to show and recover on screens and you've been hopeless at it. And it's the only defense that you've got for an on ball. Um, and you're talking about sacrificing, uh, stopping that and moving on just because they haven't learned it in time. And now we're going to move on to free throws, which is something you're awesome at. Like that would be an obvious time where, okay, well, we can just take time away from free throws because we don't need to practice that as much. So I, I guess it's going into the session where with clear priorities. And I often find that I, I put scrimmages, like five on five scrimmages last uh, and run out of time to get to them, but they are reasonably important. So uh, that's something that I am trying to work on myself. Uh, I've got another question here for you, Ryan, from Cooper yep. J. Uh, when you plan your session for 10 players and only have seven or eight ten up, turn up, yep. how do you adjust? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good one. So I actually believe I have that in one of the slides later down the track. So obviously that happens a lot, like especially at a junior level. You know, kids are sick. I rolled my ankle at school. We're kind of fortunate at a senior level because we have development players. We have training partners. Uh, we can use some juniors as well. So we kind of always make up our numbers, but also having coached at a junior level, it can be really difficult. So what I found is each drill or each training session that I've kind of laid out, I allow it to be adjusted and I try my best to ask myself those questions prior. 
So it's like, right, this drill, we're going to do five on five. It's full court. These are our purposes. You know, right, I've now lost two athletes. Now I'm going to see if I can if I can maybe bring this down to a three on three or something like that. And I can adapt it into the half court. I always look at each of our drills and just be sure that I can adjust it if possible to the numbers that you might have on the night. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a really good answer, Ryan. I, um, I would say, Cooper, that uh, Ryan and I coach the SDP sessions in Ballarat and we have no idea how many kids are going to come to each one. <laughs> and we have no idea yeah. how many boys or girls are going to show up. It can be between sort of 30 and eight. So you've just got to be creative um, and, and be bold with your drills and, 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 your, and your small-sided games and things like that. And if, if you were planning to have this four-on-four four and you were going to build from two-on-two two all the way up to four-on-four, four, just think about how you can, you can change that. And you might find that you changed it and you're like, well, this is going to be really good. And then you watch the kids do it. That's just woeful. And so you just, you just don't do that again. Like you're, you're allowed to make mistakes too, you know. I, I would just encourage you to, to be creative with – the the drills or the or the games or whatever you're trying to teach and think of new ways to teach it if you only have eight and you were playing it for five on five and um yeah doesn't work just don't do it again perfect terrific right joel i'm right to move on to the next one right so this one is um this one's really important and can actually be a little bit confronting as a coach as well but it's uh what is it like to be coached by me so athletes and kids pick up on the way you coach slash teach. If you are a talker, they may zone out. And if you don't keep a finger on the pulse of your training session, they'll run rings around you. So does your method of coaching allow you to maximize your training session? So I've got something in the bottom right hand corner, which I actually want to come back to. So this one's, um, this one is a difficult one. And like I said, quite confronting for some coaches, but it's something that you do need to ask yourself like, Right, if we're in the middle of a drill and it's not working the way I want and it looks really horrible, do you bring the kids in? Do you bring them in the middle? You talk, you go over all your points again and then you disperse again. Because early, early in, my, um, in my, my coaching journey, I was a lot like that. I was very hands-on. I needed to have the athletes looking at me in the eyes so I could really feel like I was coaching. And... I just did, you know, just the more experiences I got at some higher levels and whatnot, I realized just how much time I was wasting by consistently stop starting drills. I wasn't letting them sort of, so it's a quote being like forged in the fire. Like I wasn't letting them just go out there and try it and fail a couple of times and then try again and maybe get it. Like I just kept bringing them in and I was very, being very controlling. So you need to, um, you just need to identify some things that you do as a coach and some of your methods and see how they're going to impact on your session. Uh, so another one for me is I'm very big, again, at a senior level, very big on culture. And the moment our culture or our team standards aren't held uh, to the way they should be or the level they should be, uh, I'll quite often crack it. And I'll stop the session. I'll say, is this how we do things here? And things like that. And then we get back to it. Like that's something that we do at that level because uh, quite, you know, again, at a senior level, it's not so much things as, oh, you need to do that layup with your left hand, things like that. Those type of things uh, aren't as prevalent at a senior level. So for us, it is a culture thing. It's we've all bought into this standard of basketball. This is how we want to be represented. These are the things we want to stand by. And if they're not being upheld, I will stop a session and remind everybody and our captains might have a bit of a talk or something like that. So that might change back down at a, at a kind of a junior elite level as well, or even a domestic level. You might just want to start to just, you know, just sort of take some notes and sometimes just stand back and might be halfway through the session and go, how am I coaching tonight? Is the way I'm coaching keeping the session going and I'm maximizing my time or have I actually wasted a fair bit of time off some kind of irrelevant speaking at times so that's something that um that i definitely think more coaches need to be able to do to just sit back and try to evaluate themselves and something that i've got down here in the bottom right hand corner which again is something that i'm still getting the hang of uh it's something that i learned a couple of years ago now and it's uh it's learned to coach on the fly so what that means is being able to just move with the session not having to stop everything bring everyone in talk about what's going on, how we could improve things and then sending them back out. It's, you know, you might, might be in the heat of a drill, everything's going, you know, um, and you might pull somebody across and say, 
hey, next time you need to make sure you've really got your eyes to the basket when you make that dribble or you need to be willing to, once you get two feet in the paint, you need to have your eyes up to see receivers and then let them go back in the drill, not blow the whistle, stop the drill, talk to that one player or the five players and then start again. It's kind of learning to just fly with the session and coaching on the run. Anything to add, Joel? Um, yes, I've got something to add. No, no questions yet, but feel free to ask away, guys. Um, one of the things that I use with uh, new coaches that we have at our Vic Country things um, is because coaching on the fly is massive at, uh, as any part of the high performance pathway. And one thing that I say to them is, unless more than half of your group is totally struggling with the concept, don't stop the drill. Because there's nothing that a, a senior high performance Sorry. coach or a director of coaching or, or anyone dislikes more than them talking for three minutes or, or longer um, and then sending the kids back out to watch their basket coach pull the whole group in and talk to them again. So if mm -hmm. you've got 10 kids and, and, and four of them have problems, individually pull each one of those four across at different times and re-explain that concept versus sacrificing time on the drill. Um, so yeah, more than half, stop the drill, less than half individually. Perfect. Do we have any questions, Joel, or are we good? No questions. Sorry, I forgot to mute myself. I'm good at this. Perfect. <laughs> all good, as long as we're recording this time. Um, all right, so we'll move on to the next slide, which is our understanding your environment. So this one is probably more aimed at some of our uh, domestic coaches. Um, and even for, even for us at a Ballarat level, um, at a senior level here, when we had the new stadium getting built, uh, we had to use a bunch of different venues. We'd go from different high schools and things like that. And the environment was consistently changing from the state of the courts, the state of the rings, scoreboards, all these sort of things that were kind of out of your control and that you had to be willing to adapt to. So understanding your environment, each team's training venue times and equipment will vary. How well do you know yours? So simple things like you might only have half a court. Uh, it might not be regulation size. There's a bunch of different things that might change week in, week out. Some weeks you might have a full court. So you might think you're coming to training and I'll, I've only got a half court. That's what normally happens tonight. You have a full court. So that's terrific. So, you know, my environment's changed. Can I adapt my training session to now utilise a full court? So these are all type of barriers that all coaches have to deal with at all levels. Um, and it's, you know, things that we talked about before, such as, you know, players injuring themselves and things like that and you weren't expecting them to not be there tonight that's now changed things so you just need to um, understand what your environment is like around you at the different venues that you might be at and just be willing to sort of uh, roll on with that if that makes sense so does anybody um, have any questions sort of on understanding your environment these next two ones uh, we're probably going to fly through it's um understanding your environment, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, time management as well. So the environment one is more just a, um, it's just one that I think every coach should just always keep in the back of their mind, like the equipment that we have, all those type of questions, you just want to make sure you've really got a good understanding for. So when you get to your session, you don't, you don't need to have those excuses, oh, well, there's no scoreboard or there's no this, and all of a sudden you're not maximising that time you have because you already understand where you're going to be and you're accepting of things to potentially change. So if we have any questions on that one, feel free to shoot them through. I do think that one's pretty of um, pretty self-explanatory to most and is just something that I feel like is uh, helpful when it comes to maximising your training session. Yeah, no, no questions here, Ryan. So we can probably just move on if, if you're happy to do that. Perfect, more than happy to. So understanding time. So I'm going to actually shoot all the way down to this quote that I've got down the bottom. Now, I've got no idea if this is the correct quote. I don't actually know who it's from. But I scribbled this on a training session that I did at a, a Vic Country event in Shepparton like a couple of years ago. And it was um, time is what we want, yet we use it the worst. So time as a coach is something that we, we always want. And I've actually got a actually got a bit of a story. I've been um, talking with a couple of coaches over in the States at the moment that are interested in uh, some of our players. And this one coach from a Division Two school in uh, somewhere near the, around the New York area, uh, we were talking and things like that. And he was just got kind of sharing to me his experiences at uh, NCAA level. And for, for their team, 
they have really strict rulings around the amount of time that they're allowed to have with their athletes. So there's a coaching staff of five at that level, a Division Two school in America, and those coaches will sort out. So if they have eight hours for the week with those players, that might include gym time as well. Sometimes that varies depending on the semester. They, every Monday morning, for, he said, about two to sometimes three hours, will plan out the entire week all the way down to the final minute on how they're going to utilise their time because they cannot go over that time. If they get eight hours that week and, you know, they do nine and they get reported and things like that, they get in a lot of trouble with, um, with NCAA. So understanding time as a coach is absolutely critical to when it comes to maximising your training session. Understanding time is probably the biggest one. So obviously my first point here is if you have an hour and in that hour you do a warm-up, a cool-down, plus some drink breaks, that really might only leave you with 50 minutes. So does your training plan reflect 50 minutes or does it reflect an entire hour? Because if it reflects an entire hour, immediately your session plan is going to be altered. So you need to really be willing to to sit down and go, right, well, you know, you, you might actually need to pencil in drink breaks. At a junior level, you might need to say, well, after these two drills, we'll get a drink break. After this one drill, we'll get another one. You might need to do that so you can really maximise the time that you have with the athletes on the floor. So second one here is uh, start on time and finish on time. Being a good coach means you're well organised. So one thing that I've seen a couple of times with some coaches at a representative level and it's a, it's a little bit frustrating and I kind of understand why some parents might get a little bit annoyed is, uh, is the finishing on time some of us coaches can really struggle with. It's if the training session is due to start at six and finish at eight. If you still have all the kids in the middle of the floor and you're talking at eight, you know, the, you've, you've, kind of, uh, you've kind of dropped the eight ball a little bit in terms of understanding your time as a coach. Like at eight o'clock, those kids are off the floor, they've done their cool down, ready for either the next group to go or they're back with the parents. Like you need to be really conscious of your start and finish times. And the starting time as well, as Joel said before, uh, working in SDP level here, we'll do morning sessions that go from uh, seven to eight in the morning. And our, our kids are shoes on completely into warm ups, and, you know, pretty much in a mid sweat by seven o'clock. Like they're ready to go, entirely ready to go. So if you start a session at six o'clock, six o'clock doesn't mean that last kid's tying up his shoes and waddling onto the middle of the court. Like, no, no, at six o'clock, like you already, you know, into your warm-ups, ready to go, and everybody's really locked in. And that's something that does come down to you as a coach. You need to be the one that's really pushing that issue, that time is something that we take really serious here. And it can be something that you say to your athletes, like, hey, guys, we only get two hours a week on four. And we need to be ready for a Friday night game or whatever it might be. I, I put that to my athletes and I say, this is the time that we have together. It's your choice if you want to really lock in for that time that we can maximise it or, you know, or not. And if they don't want to, that sort of says a lot about the athlete. So uh, keep an eye on the scoreboard, either with a watch, scoreboard or an assistant coach. I understand everybody's not blessed to have an assistant coach. So if you have a watch where you can sort of track time or you can put time on a scoreboard which is still something I do do that just so it's always there you know what's going on again you might not have a scoreboard so if you can use your watch use your phone something like that just so you can really track the time I definitely recommend doing that so uh, understanding time probably the um, probably the most important one when it comes to maximizing a training session is, uh, is really understanding your time. And these are just a few of the points. I know there'll be uh, many more around this type of subject, but uh, these are ones that I definitely think are important for coaches. So, um, uh, Ryan, so I'm just going to interject. I, I just got a couple yeah. of things to add on that. Um, oh, man. So I think what you what you mentioned there about like if, if, if the session finishes at eight, then they're off the floor at eight. You just have to be really consistent uh, and you have to be, descriptive and, and, and find out when you're talking to your parents. If, if you are training from six till seven and, and like Brian said, you've got a warm up, cool down, that doesn't leave you much time on the court. It's more than okay that you start your session at quarter two six off the floor yeah. and they all do their own Definitely. little warm up there. But you've just got to tell the parents that earlier. Like I, I've, I've coached with people before who consistently finished 15 minutes after time plus then the kid had to, you know, change their shoes and then they got in the car and the, the coach, you know, 
heroically sort of said, well, the kids don't want to work hard. They'll stay late sort of thing. But all it did was yeah. drive a wedge between um, him and the parents. And then he couldn't understand when the parents weren't in love with him coming into the season. And what he didn't understand as, <laughs> as like we, we were both fairly young back then is like some parents, you know, and, and some of you guys have, have kids yourself, but parent might have three, four kids and they're trying to do a little Houdini act to get them all from training from different parts of, of wherever you live. And it's really difficult to do that. And, and you really are respecting the parent by, allowing them to be there uh, walking out the door when you say you do the same way you expect a parent to drop them off when they're meant to be there. So um, I thought that was really important to, to drum home. And, and, and lastly, something that Richard um, mentioned to me before, uh, it, if you've got a clock, run it before training session so they understand when training starts and then have that as part of your culture or part of your team, uh, I guess, ideas is, is that what they must do by the time that uh, happens so uh, at Richard and my sessions we, we run the clock uh, at a quarter to I think it's seven when we start it's been so long now I can't remember when we train um, and the boys know when they walk in that, that clock's running until the start of training and they know that they have to be warmed up by then uh, and, and and they do that I, I, I'm generally off either chatting to Richard or another coach before that happens uh, and then I just walk in at start time and they're all ready to go because that's been ingrained and because I consistently worked on that for the start. So, so just being consistent and, and being respectful are, are really two important parts in, in understanding how to use your time. Sure. Ready to move on then? Yeah, by all means. So this is the, uh, this is the last slide that I have. So I'm just going to say some things on the, um, on the right hand side before my little, uh, little quote at the top there is uh, session plans and the way we use them are forever changing new ideas and ways to utilize your time with the players. Don't be afraid to give something a go. And if it, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't reflect as to why. So that's something that I'm really big on is there's always new things coming out. Obviously, you know, in basketball, we look at the, the way training sessions run from different plays to the way you play defense. Like things are always changing and evolving don't be afraid to give something a go. And if it works, like that's great. Even reflect on that, like it worked really well because of A, B and C. If it didn't, also write that down. And if there's a, if there's a, a team captain or something like that and the, the idea that you had for the training session really didn't work, don't be afraid to talk to the athletes and say, hey mate, like tried this tonight. Obviously it was a bit ugly, it didn't work quite well. Like what do you think? And actually get a player's perspective. Like that's something that can really help you with the way you set out your training sessions and the way you maximize them is not being afraid to, to talk to your athletes as well. Cause they're going to be the ones ultimately that are, are driving the session and uh, you know, you're trying to maximize it for their development. So don't be afraid to get their opinion from time to time. Uh, so obviously in the top left-hand corner here, I've got be a lifelong learner, which is basically just summing up what I've just said here on the right, which is just, you know, always ask questions. There's so many resources out there available for coaches now. Uh, so just, you know, it doesn't matter where you start, just get out there, get your hands dirty, try to learn something, ask some questions and, uh, yeah, really adapt to the kind of philosophy of being a lifelong learner. Cause the more you do that, uh, you know, the, hopefully the more successful coaching career you'll have and the, the more places you'll get to go if you really kind of, um, follow that sort of philosophy there. So that's uh, all I had for tonight and my presentation. I've also got down the bottom here to please reach out to Joel and myself at Basketball Ballarat. This is our job. We're more than happy to help coaches uh, along their pathway and their development any way we can. So uh, obviously I've got my email there and Joel will also put that out when he uh, sends this out to all of you guys as well. So please uh, don't feel, um, don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight and uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo that last part there. Like, feel free to reach out. You know, we're, we're basketball coaches that don't really coach basketball at the moment. So we're just looking uh, for people to talk to about basketball. So uh, I've had a couple of good emails with um, Alistair, I think, in here at the moment. And I really love that bit of back and forth. And um, I've, I've teed up a phone call with Brad, who's in here as well, a couple of times and, and stood him up both times. But I'll, I'll definitely call you this weekend, Brad. Um, so, so yeah, like, please do reach out. We're more than happy to answer other questions. Um, the other thing is week one of these series, if you didn't see it was on how to plan a training session. Uh, and I think that how to plan a training session and how to maximize your time, they do tie in really well. So if you have some questions or you think we might've skipped over some things and you haven't seen week one, um, definitely watch week one and see if we cover them there. 
especially on like timing and running clock and stuff like that and how to lay out points of emphasis, how to keep on track, stuff like that, which I guess is, is a bit off to the side of what Ryan spoke about tonight. So, so watch that. And then if, if there's still something you think we've missed, like by all means, let us know. And, and we'll try and include that um, in the coming weeks. So that ties us up for tonight. Now, for next week, we will be talking about how to teach defense. Uh, and then the following week, we'll be t- t- talking about how to teach offense. So th- that will really be aimed at um, uh, young kids, sort of eight to 12. Maybe they haven't played a lot of basketball before, how we start off with 1v1 and how we build that into team defense and what's sort of important to to uh, cross off along the way. So we do hope you tune in for those and I'll, I'll send out the registration link when I send this out tomorrow morning. Uh, I can do it tomorrow morning because I've recorded it already so I don't have to do another recording. Um, and lastly, for next week and the next couple of weeks after that, we're going to be moving this back to 8 p.m. on the Wednesday night. I really hope that doesn't uh, upset anybody. Um, it's just that we're, we're struggling to, to fit this in at seven o'clock with a few other things we've got going on with um, Basketball Victoria stuff at the moment. So uh, it will be pushed back to eight. We will still be recording it. So if that doesn't suit you, it'll still be on YouTube and you can watch it there. But yeah, p- please, um, if, if that's a major problem, we'll be swinging it back in a couple of weeks probably. So, so please let me know. But otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And yeah, by all means, hit us up if you've got any questions. Thanks, Joel Thanks, and Ryan. No worries. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.